I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, The Brightness of, Glo of God's Glory. The Brightness of God's Glory. And as I said, we're going to plunge into the a new book, the book of Hebrews. In, in the New Testament, it is a very uh, a Jewish book by nature. It, it should be a great blessing to you. And I want to, to bring you today to a passage, and I hope that when we get out of here that we are just uh, re looking at the Lord Jesus Christ. We see His glory. We see Him for something much more than what He is. Frankly, you and I often see the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we, we, we back that up and we back our appreciation up uh, to Him with, with basically cliche things that we have learned from ver Bible verses or from uh, what pastors have said or Sunday school teachers. And really all that we think about him is generally based on his salvation. And that's wonderful. And that's one of the greatest things that he's ever done for us. But I would like to show you today some, some things beyond just the fact that Jesus died for me and I love him. And that is true. But I would like to to stir you as the Apostle Paul who said in and of himself that I may know him. His passion in life was to know Jesus Christ. Yes, as Lord and Savior, but beyond that, to know the person of Jesus Christ, of why he pleased his Father so much, of why he was perfectly righteous, of why he made the Pharisees who had hearts that were hardened so mad and yet it made sinner, sinners so gracious and so fulfilled and so full after they met him. Tonight, it's just this morning, it really is, Adam, it's not tonight yet. This morning, I would like you to get a passion of knowing your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of who he is. Father in heaven, reveal to us the brightness of your glory, Jesus Christ. I pray, O oh God, that you would help us in each and every heart today, that we would put away the roast beef or whatever we're going to do afterward, that we would forget about the temperature on the outside and the temperature on the inside. We'd forget about what's going on around us and distractions that certainly may come from, from things, and that we would look at Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you would just give us a little glimpse of Jesus today. And I ask that we would be changed by seeing him. Lord, you're so good to us. You are so much higher than us. Lord, we, we work and strive to understand you just a little bit. And as you revealed yourself just a little bit to Moses in all your glory and his face shine, I ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself a little to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In our human logic in Christianity, we must be careful not to put the the cart before the horse and, and, and understanding salvation and understanding God's plan of salvation and the perspective of two things, the perspective of Jesus and who he is and also the perspective of man. You and I have often heard phrases like this. Please stay with me lest you misunderstand what I'm about to say. It will challenge your thinking. We've often heard phrases like this. The most important thing to God is for people to get saved and then everyone says amen. Really? Is that really true? The most important thing to almighty, sovereign, eternal God is for humans to get saved? So almighty, infinite God's highest priority rests on something that he made? If that is true, then what was God's highest priority to him before he made anything? Did he not have any priority then? We hear phrases like soul winning must be the highest priority in the church. Really? Does soul winning outrank, for instance, worshiping God himself? Does it outrank uh, uh, people, believers growing? Does it outrank prayer? Should the church's only emphasis be soul winning? Please understand, if you're a visitor here, that this pastor believes heavily in going and banging on doors as we did yesterday and telling people about Jesus Christ. But we need to understand where the cart comes. And it does not become come before the horse. These phrases are wrong because of a certain thing. And they're wrong because they make the work of God, what God is willing to do, of a higher priority, uh, uh, importance than understanding God himself. They make, let me say that a different way. They make the work of God of the highest importance and totally skip the understanding that God's works are done to exalt God. What he does never can become more important than who he is. 
We must never forget in our zeal for souls that salvation is wonderful first because it exalts God and especially Jesus Christ. And that is the emphasis. And secondly, because it spares a man from damnation. It is wonderful because it is God's plan. It is wonderful because it comes from the loving character of God. It is wonderful because God was doing more in salvation than rescuing your soul. And that's what we're going to talk about from the verses today. In fact, we will see that, God, that Christ's salvation work accomplished more than rescuing man. I love every one of you, but I have not been boring enough yet to sleep. All right? All right? Everybody with me? Ushers, about 40 minutes, start handing out Mountain Dew. All right? <laughs> got to stay awake here. You got to get coffee. This is too important for you to understand. God wants you to grow here. He wants you to see Jesus. Don't come here to sleep. Come here to listen. If you got to take notes, if you got to stand up, if your wife has to smack you, so be it. So be it. All right. All right. That shows that men sleep, not women, and that's generally true. I'll say that again. We will see that Christ's salvation work accomplished more than rescuing mankind. There are other divine priorities that God the Father had when he, devi he devised salvation's plan. Other motives on God's heart when he sent Jesus. These other things or what is going to exalt Jesus Christ in our hearts today. If you turn back over to Hebrews chapter 1, in verse number 1 through 3, I'll let you stand up one more time, all right? Get a, a, another second chance at getting this message in your brain and heart. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, Hebrews 1, 1, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You may be seated. Today we're going to be preaching, begin preaching through the book of Hebrews. As it indicates, the, the, the title itself, it is a heavily Jewish book. Hebrews, Jewish, very Jewish. Uh, it was written specifically to the early Jews who were making the transition from Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, being an Orthodox Jew, the only thing they ever knew, and a bunch of practices and all these formalities to understanding that Jesus Christ's death on the cross was sufficient alone to please the Father. And believing on that was alone what was necessary to be right with the Lord God. This was hard for them to swallow. There was much confusion and mixing of religious practice with the details of the law in the early church. The book of Hebrews challenges every Christian Jew to take their eyes off the old law and the old practices as insufficient and frustrating. In fact, only just a school teacher to bring us to what is sufficient, to put our eyes upon the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins and belief on Him and Him alone. Met a, I met a lady who was very, if I said the religion you would know, and I don't, wanna, I, I don't necessarily want to say it right now, but she was heavily steeped in a religious practice that is very common in America today. And so steeped in that religion and that formality and all the details of formality and brought up in that. So that as a little girl, I'm so sure she sit in these services and heard these mantras and, 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 uh, and repeating of languages she didn't even understand and came to the point where she uh, connected that with God. And that, that thing of religious practice became very comfortable to her and she could not imagine salvation outside of it. In fact, told us that. Please understand, whatever we are familiar with does not mean it saves. Whatever we are used to or whatever formality and whatever we think of religion, only Jesus Christ on the cross saves. That is the only thing, one and only thing, Christ alone. On Christ alone our hope is built. We, are, we stand there securely in Jesus Christ. He is sufficient. Theologians argue about the authorship of this book of Hebrews. Who was it written by? Was it written by Paul? Sounds very Pauline in some places. Maybe it was written by somebody else. I do not know. I only know one author, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. And this book has worked on my heart, and I would hope to open it up. And whether Paul wrote it or whoever did, I know that it is the Word of God. And so we look at it. Before we begin this, uh, these few verses, these three verses, I want to tell you a story that is from Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 33. You don't have to turn there or you can. It's up to you. It is, gives a little bit of context of where this is coming from. It's Jesus telling a story, and he's really telling a story about himself, and he tells a story like this. He says, there once was a very rich landowner, and uh, he bought a vineyard, 
And he added to that vineyard. He added, he hedged it about beautifully and he built a tower on that vineyard. And uh, he made it just a gorgeous vineyard so that it was very productive. And so having done that, he hired men who would manage the vineyard for him with the understanding that he would return when it was time to cash in on the profits. It's his fruit. Obviously he paid them a wage, but when it was time for the harvest, he would come and get the money from it. He, the Bible says that he goes, Jesus said he, go, he went to a different land, a faraway country. And when it was time to reap for the harvest, he sent back uh, a servants of his to come and, 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 and sell the fruit and to get the, get the money, the profit. But the men who he had hired out, the managers, got another idea. Since the landowner was far away, they decided that they would abuse the servants and not give him the money. They would keep it for themselves. And so the Bible says they beat, him, beat them, they, they stoned them and did different things to them. And the, the master, not understanding why this was going on, and I'm sure that they didn't have email in those days, he sent other servants and then other servants. All the same hat thing happened. They beat them, they stoned them, they would not give them the profit. And one day he, he says this. He says, they didn't respect any of those other servants. He says, if I send to them my son, certainly they'll reverence my son, they'll respect him. And so that's exactly what, the, what he did. The, the son makes the long trip, the trek, and he comes to the vineyard, thinking that they would respect him, the father thinking they would respect him. And when he got to the vineyard, some of you know the end of the story. The Bible says that the managers of the vineyard saw him and thought another thing. They thought, this is the heir. If we kill him, the vineyard is ours. And that's exactly what they did. They killed the son of the master. It's not hard for anyone to understand that the, the, the son is talking about Jesus Christ, who sent before many, uh, many servants and then came himself. And did they respect him? No. I tell you the story because that's really the way Hebrews starts, introducing us to God and something that he's been trying to accomplish throughout all history by sending servants and his son. Notice verse number one, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets or unto your great great grandpappy and his great great grandpappy and pappy, all the pappies before. He tried to talk to them in all different kinds of ways through history. God has been trying to reach out to his rebellious creation. Specifically to his chosen people, the Jews, who had been rebellious and ultimately to us. He sent them prophets, great men like Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nathan and Samuel and others and minor prophets and major prophets and big prophets and small prophets. To encourage them all to turn their hearts to the Lord. To surrender to him was the message. To turn away from sin and surrender to God Almighty who is the landowner who has gone to a far land. That didn't work for over 6,000 years. They would not hear them. They beat many of them. They threw Jeremiah into a pit. They, uh, God told Isaiah, I'm going to send you to preach, but no one's going to listen to you. So in his infinite plan, he did something else. He sent his son, as Jesus' story was. Look at verse number two. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. It is here, folks, that we realize that God had a bigger motive in mind than man's salvation. This master plan had much to do with, the fa with God, the Father's will concerning the one he sent, Jesus, the saving one, the Savior. In fact, let me tell you, salvation's plan has more to do with Jesus, the Savior, than it has to do with you, the saved one. As I've already said, we naturally focus on the work and miss the motive of why the Savior was sent. It was not only to rescue man, although that's a wonderful benefit, a tremendous one. It was for the father to have a proper stage, a proper stage to lift up his son, the second member of the Godhead. Notice from here on out in our passage and throughout the book of Hebrews, there is one thing that is focus point, all the time mentioning salvation, but one thing is focused on Jesus. Jesus. All the attention quickly shifts to describing and exalting Jesus Christ. The rescuer is the focus of salvation, not man's escape. Look down at your Bible. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the, unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand, of the majesty on high. Take your eyes and scan from verse number 4 to the end of verse number 14. It is all about one person, Jesus, and how great he is. 
Let's look at God exalting His Son here. There are five descriptions in these three verses with the goal to give Jesus a more magnified place in our thoughts and in our heart, in our authority, the authority of our lives. Paul says in another place as I opened it with, that I may know Him. Let me ask you a question. Is it, is, is it your passion to know Jesus Christ? You know Him as your Lord and Savior, many of them. You, you, many of you, you've accepted Him. But I want to tell you, there is more to know about Jesus Christ. There's more to know about Him. And it's all intertwined. That day at Calvary was just an expression of who Jesus is. It was just something He did because of who. And this morning we want to begin looking at the who. Description number one, Jesus is the mouthpiece of the Father. Look at verse number two. It says, Hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son. These last days. We are in the last days. Amen? We're it. We're it. We're, we're it. Okay? The last days speak of a dispensation. Dispensation is just time periods. If you look at your Bibles and go through historically, God worked in different ways in different time periods in order to be able to work with mankind. These last days, he's spoken... Wake up, Jack. He's so tired. All right. I love you, Jack. If you're an adult, I wouldn't have woken you up because I would have been embarrassed. I'd have got a lot of trouble. But I know your mom would want me to wake you up. All right. If you're Mrs. Thompson, I may have woken you up. All right. In these last days, we are in the last days. And in the last days... There, are, there is the age of grace or the age of the church. And then we're done. God is working. He's worked for 6,000 years through prophets and telling us about Jesus coming. And then here in the last days, it's about Jesus. He comes. He is the living word. He is the word. A lot of guys, uh, prophets in olden days, they spoke. God says, God says, God says, Jesus comes and says, I say. Verily I say unto you. He was the living word, the mouthpiece of the Father. The Father thought, the Father spoke through His Son. He was the mouthpiece of the Godhead. He was the word of God to mankind. The special living revelation of the heart of God the Father. He walked, He breathed, He spoke God. He was God in the flesh. Jesus said in John 12, verse 49, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. When Jesus opened his mouth, God came out. Do you know that? There's no separation. It's a divine channel, a divine conduit, straight from Jehovah. The epistles often refer to the commandment of the Lord. As Paul says, a new thing I write unto you, not what the Lord spoke. That's Jesus. The gospels and the epistles are Jesus communicating the will of his Father as mediator to you and me. One mediator. The Holy Spirit, when he would come... Jesus said very clearly, he's going to remind you of everything I told you. In John 14, 26, he says that he'll bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever things I've commanded you. When the Holy Spirit came, and as he is here, he reminds us of Jesus. He reminds us of what Jesus says in the written and the living word. Jesus is the mediator. He is the mouthpiece of God. Why would God even want to communicate to his rebellious creation? We take it for a granted that God... We open up Hebrews 1. We begin reading God. Okay, he spoke to creation through uh, prophets, and then he spoke through us. Wait a minute. Time out. Why would he even talk to us at all? It's, it's not something we should take for granted. Why in the world would God Almighty stoop down to talk to little specks of ants like us? Why would he expend so much energy and time chasing those who didn't want to be caught? And the greatest love and grace question of all, why would he choose to send his son to communicate to you and to me? It was all of his great love to speak to us by Jesus. The Bible says here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. You know, it's no big deal that you love God. I love God. Look at me. I'm a some kind of Christian. Yeah, you're some kind of fortunate Christian <laughs> by grace. It's no big deal that you love God. Who would not love God? Except fools, the Bible says. The fool has said in, their, in his heart, no God. That's a fool. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sin. That's love. That is unconditional love. Follow, please, the timeline of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have dwelled eternally in time past before angels in heaven and the world and mankind and anything. There was a time when only one thing existed. You know what that was? God. Try to imagine that. I want you really to try to. Imagine in your brain right now uh, that there's nothing but God. Nothing. Not even heaven yet. No angels, nothing. 
They're all created to things. It was only God. I think things like, what did he do? Is there blackness around him or is blackness something? Just God. And it's not like that it was for a short period of time. It was forever before. No beginning. Just God. In his solo existence, one day, I have no idea when, God created a plan of the universe and it's revealed to us. He would make things that would glorify him. First, he would make a habitation called heaven. Then angels and mag magnificent principalities, things too powerful for us to understand. Then he would create a universe with a world that would have a certain kind of being. And this being would be special. He would create him in his own image. He would have a soul. He would have a spirit and feelings and thoughts. And most of all, he would have a free will. He would have a choice. So that he would choose whether to love God and respond to the love of God. He took into account that that being would sin. He took into account that he would rebel against him. He took into account that it would cost him a son. And he decided to go on with his plan anyhow. And he did it for this ultimate pleasure. That in the end, when there was nothing but God, and in the end, when all these created things were here, all this stuff that would happen in the middle, God chose to do all this stuff in the middle because it more highly glorified him than in the beginning when it was just him. All this was his pleasure. All this that he would create would be in the end under the authority and ownership and kingship of the second person of that Godhead. And that would be Jesus Christ. And that's where we come to a greater purpose. All the existence of this universe would pinnacle with the event of the Father powerfully subduing all the rebellious creation at Armageddon and beyond to bow at the Son's feet, His Son, fallen creation and men and angels, and finally death itself, the last enemy of Jesus Christ. Everything would one day submit to them, submit to Him as their Lord. He would inherit Jesus, the second person. It was the Father's will way back when it was only Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It was the Father's will throughout this humanity, this time of creation, that in the end, the goal would be that he would exalt his Son, Jesus Christ, and every created thing would be handed to him on a silver platter, and all his enemies would become his footstool. That is the greater plan. The final action would be Jesus himself as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, submitting himself to the headship of the Father, and handing all things back to God the Father. And that and the great pleasure and the glory plan of God would be complete forever and ever and ever. I have just introduced you to the plan of God for the universe. I have just told you what the great picture is. Listen to it in 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end. Uh, when he, Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put uh, all things under his feet. But when he, he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, that is, that God, everything but God, will be under Jesus, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto to him, the Father, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Listen to this great plan in Colossians 1, 17. And he, Jesus, uh, is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Jesus should all fullness dwell. That's the big thing. It is not those that are saved, you and I. The highest priority of the church is not so people get saved. The highest priority of the church is the Savior, the one doing the saving. saving. And I praise God that people can be saved because of the Savior. If we would get our eyes, folks, more solidly on Jesus, we would want to tell more people about him. We would understand how he is exalted because every soul that comes to him just lifts him up more. He is the Savior. He is the Savior. He is the Savior. 
Do you see how Jesus is the purpose of this world? We all exist so that the Father could exalt His Son to the place of preeminence, the place of the highest standing, the supreme standing. Do you see how Jesus is the focus of everything about this world? He is the heir. We are His possession. You will either bow to Him as Savior now or be broken to bow to Him as King and Judge in eternity. The whole thing is about you must submit to the Savior. You either give Him your heart now or frankly, God will wrench it from you and give it to him as you are eternally punished for your sin. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. The people in this world, they think they're so all of that and that they have, their life is all about them. And I've told you this before. Men in this world are like ants in a glass ant farm that a little boy holds with freckles on his face. And the ants inside are so busy doing what is the, the job of the colony. And they're so, the individual ant is so important about getting his grain of rice. He, he just thinks it's the biggest thing on earth to do, to get his grain of rice back to the right hole, into the right place. It's everything. And the little boy holds it in his hands and looks on and laughs at the ant. Folks, God is holding us. We are not holding him. And the highest importance of your life must be what the Lord wants for you. And understand what I said, either you bow to him. I don't know if every one of you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or not, that you believed on him and you've given your life to him. You cannot believe and take him unless you've submitted your life to him. That means you can't hold on to your, your sin and hold the Savior also and believe the Savior also. It just it can't work that way. And I don't know if there's somebody here that you just hold on to your heart and you will not give it because you are such the arrogant ant. And you want to do your thing. But I, can I tell you that you would submit to the Lord Jesus today? That you would lay down your heart so that God Almighty in eternity doesn't have to pull it from you and make you bow to Jesus Christ? That you would willingly turn from sin and trust the Lord Jesus? I beg you, lost man, lost woman without Jesus, will you bow to Him today? and give him your life. I ask you Christians, since everything is outside, everything that is outside of the Godhead, everything you can even imagine, that picture on the wall, this, every, everything you can imagine, every being, every animal, everything, since everything right now, literally, is the inheritance of Jesus Christ. It is all going to be given to him. Since that is true, I ask you right now, is everything in your life submitted to him? Does Jesus right now have control of your possessions? Does Jesus right now have control of your lifestyle, control of your finances, control of your family, control of your habits, control of your time, of your dress, of your desires? Does Jesus right now have you as a person with your life bowing to him? He is the heir of all things. Everything that is yours is his. Your calendar is his. And the Father will hand your calendar to him one day. Everything that you are is His. Does Jesus have control of all? Don't you realize you exist for Him to receive the preeminence in all things? Away with selfish Christianity. Away with me, Christianity. Give it all to Jesus, Christian. Your salvation was for Him to have the preeminence. Your possessions are for Jesus to have the preeminence. Your vocation, your job is for Jesus to have the preeminence. That the fullness of all the universe may be for Jesus alone. Alone. Your existence is not about your pleasure. It's about the Father's pleasure in exalting Jesus. Don't make your Heavenly Father wrench things out of your hand for Jesus. Give them to Him willingly. You know, it reminds me, after a few children, I think I've seen this so many times on my own. It's like, a, it's like an infant that has a big old fat fist holding on to something that is not his and won't let go. That's how we are. What is in the fist of your life is not yours. It's Jesus's. Let go of it. You're grabbing, so I have my rights. I want to do with my life, with my family, what I want to do. I want to do with my thoughts, what I want to do. I want to do with my body, what I want to do. I want to do with my dress, what I want to do. I want to do with my music, what I want to do. I want to do what I want to do. You're a fat-fisted toddler that needs to let go. Mine, mine. It's not yours. This universe was made to hand to God the Son. He has the preeminence. It's not ours. I'm going to let you in on a secret because I feel like I have to be nice now. The Bible says that he's going to share it with you anyhow in the end. We are co-heirs with Jesus. Nothing wrong with handing it up to him now. He's going to share things of his own pleasure with us in heaven.
because he's a sharer. Description number three here in your Bible talking about Jesus. He is the creator of the world. Let's look at the end of verse number two. The Bible says this, by whom also he made the worlds, the worlds, the worlds. That's everything. Every planet, the worlds. The Bible says in John 1, 3 about Jesus, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Just in case you thought that something escaped, no. Jesus made everything. The in the beginning God created was God the Son. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God, that's Jesus. In the beginning God is Jesus. He created all things in six days, morning and an evening. Unless you would think by chance that there was something missing about the day he tells you. And morning and evening, and morning and evening, and morning and evening. I know what morning is, and I know what evening is. That's a day. All right, that's a day. There's no such truth as theistic or progressive evolution that either credits God for evolution or progressive, which I studied on, uh, up on this week, which credits God with making all kinds of animals over a long millions of years. He just progressively made them every thousands of years, made something else, something. Man, I'm telling you what, you've got to be really dumb to believe that. You have really got to be messed up. I mean, you can't, you know, you've got to really work hard at it. I am just smart enough to believe that the morning and the evening were the first day. Day, six days. Jesus was the member of the Godhead that made you and everything around you. It was Jesus. When our forefathers said that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, they, whether they knew it or not, they were talking about our Creator, Jesus. Jesus. Sadly, some men that have tried to outthink themselves as believers have given in to the compromises of evolution or theistic evolution and they are just wrong. And I pray God that, would, they, that he would open their eyes. From the very beginning, Jesus has been the mediator between the Father and mankind. He made the womb he was born in. Think of that. He made the star that hung over Bethlehem that marked his, his birth. He made the thorns that pierced him, the tree that he was nailed to. Your creator is your savior. He made you. And let me tell you something. He'll make you again new if you'll let him. He said to a bunch of religious people one day, you must be born again. To a specific man named uh, Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's not enough that he made you once. He wants to make you twice. You're not born into God's family. Boom, boom. Woohoo, woohoo. Flags go up. That's not what you hear, is it? Listen, I don't care what this world says. The Bible says you are born of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, you'll do. Ouch. It's talking about Pastor Whitmer, too. Me. I know that. And Amy can attest to it. But the Bible says that he'll make you brand new. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but the washing of being made new by the Holy Spirit, but the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. You say, I'm not good enough to come to Jesus Christ. Good. Because he's the one that does the gooding. He's the one that changes you from the inside out. He kind of works like a microwave cooks. He does it from the inside out, totally without you. His righteousness, as Pastor Pritt talked about, sung about. His righteousness. Description number four about Jesus. I hope you're loving Jesus this morning as we look at this. Look, all phrases in verse number three point to his deity. Jesus is God, who being the, the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, God's person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. All these phrases, folks, point to one thing. Jesus is God. He had to be God to miraculously bear your sin and pay the price. You know, we think about, when we think about someone dying on the cross, every one of us thinks about one person, Jesus. But do you realize that thousands upon thousands of men have died on crosses? That was just the form of death at that point. God chose it because of the shedding of blood. But listen to me, thousands of men died, but only one, the man God, could cleanse our sin by dying. Do you understand that? Jesus had to be God or his death would have been worthless. Jesus, verse number three, who's the brightness of God's glory. He is the brightness of God's glory. This is the only place in your entire Bible where this word brightness is used. It is made up of two words that are jammed together, super glued together, and it's this. Check it out. Shine off. To shine off of something. Something that f resonates here and shines off. It's talking about the Shekinah glory and the blinding perfection of, a God, of God. And if you look at Jesus Christ, you will find it. Jesus is the Shekinah glory of God. 
there's a verse, Jesus, or the song, Jesus, I am resting, and it has a, a, a phrase in it. Brightness of my Father's glory, sunshine of my Father's grace. That's what Jesus is. It's very interesting that that is said, that Jesus is the glory in verse number three, the brightness of his glory. Because I, in Isaiah 42, verse number eight, Jehovah says himself, God the Father, I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. It's the word Jehovah. I am Jehovah. Listen to this. Isaiah 42, 8, a great verse to mark in your Bible. And my glory will I not share with another. Now, wait a minute. Hebrews 1, verse 3, right in front of you, says that Jesus Christ is the brightness of God's glory. And in Isaiah 42, verse 8, it says he, he won't share his glory with another. You know why? Because Jesus is him and him is Jesus. Him is Jesus and Jesus is him. He will not, God will not share his glory with anyone else. God won't share his glory with anyone but himself because, folks, Jesus is himself. Look at the second phrase proving that Jesus is God. Jesus is the express image. Look at verse number three. And the express image of his person. Jesus is the express image of God's person. It couldn't be any clearer who he is. The word image here refers to a graved, uh, a graved copy or a stamped coin. They are exact images of the stamp. Well, bam! I went to, uh, up to the Mint up in Philadelphia before and saw all those pennies, just millions and millions of pennies, just whack, 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 all these pennies. They looked all the same. They were all the same. Jesus said that he was an exact image of the stamp of his father. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. I and my father are one. Jesus said, the words that I spoke unto you are the Father's words. When asked to see the Father by Philip, Philip, just, Philip says, just show us the Father and it will suffice us. We'll be content. Just show us God the Father. And Jesus in all his utter wisdom and all his deity says in John 14, 9, Have I been so long with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Show us the Father. I've been with you all the time. What a tremendous thing. When we think of Jesus, we need to think about the Father. They are inseparable. Jesus is the image of the Father. They cannot be divided. Jesus is spoken of, don't let it bother you, as a stamped copy, because they are certainly one, but they are two distinct people. There's two distinct persons there. Jesus and his Father. And the Holy Spirit makes three the Trinity. Don't let any Jehovah false witness make you doubt that Jesus is not God. That's damnable heresy. It is heresy. All over your Bible, if you would take the time to spend time in it each day, you will find Jesus over and over and over and over and over and over and over. His deity all over the place. When I was a teenage boy, I struggled with this greatly. We'll come to it later, but Hebrews chapter 1, this very chapter, proved to me that Jesus was God because God the Father later on calls Jesus God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And G it is enough for me to believe that Jesus is God when God calls Jesus God. All right? When we think of Jesus, you need to think of the Father. Phrase number three proves that he is God. Jesus upholds things by the word of his power. Look in verse number three. All things and upholding all things by the word of his power. What does that mean? It simply means that Jesus carries or sustains the universe. Do you ever wonder why things happen? You say, what are you talking about? All right. Please don't let an eye be put out. Please don't let an eye be put out. Please don't let an eye be put out. Why did that fall? Instead of float. No, it didn't fall because of gravity. Who's in charge of gravity? Who upholds all things by the word of his power? Why aren't we all floating around? Why does your heart beat? Did you anybody in here think about, other than our heart patients, anybody think about their heart continuing to beat during this service? No. Why do you inhale? So I don't die, Pastor? No! God does it. And more specifically, Jesus does it. Why do the world, why do the planets revolve and then orbit? Why, why, does, why does that happen? Because of Jesus Christ. Because there is someone who is sustaining, upholding all things. And I want to tell you, this is so very important, because if you'll skip over to verse number 12, in the same verse, the Bible says, And as a vesture, Jesus, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. One day the Bible says this, folks, 
It says there's coming a day that he upholds all things and another day where he says, Jesus says, that would be enough. And he takes all the universe and all the things that are made and as a vesture, a garment, he says, that's it. It's all done. It's all over. But he'll ever remain the same. Tonight, it's still this morning. I want to point you to, to the Lord Jesus Christ in all things. I want him to have the preeminence in your life. I want you to realize that it is all about Jesus Christ. He's not just the Savior. I praise God that he is the Savior. But everything in the universe is about him. And that's why Paul said that I may know him. That I may know him. The last phrase there, if you're still in Hebrews, it says, When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, pointing to his deity as Godhead, Jesus by himself had purged or cleaned our sin. Please notice that the emphasis is here is on by himself. You say, well, if I look at that pastor uh, by himself, and I know a little bit about Greek, I know, I know that uh, this is a, a word that is a, a, a genitive word, and actually himself is not there. It's referred to, etc., etc., etc. The literal translation is this, uh, of this is this. Literally, our sins are purged of him. Of him. He himself, of him, purged our sin. You say, why it's important? Because it's talking about Jesus. We normally think of God as the forgiver of sins. The Pharisees had it correct when they say, observing Jesus, telling people their sins were forgiven. Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They were exactly right. They recognized that only God could forgive sins and Jesus was doing it. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins being God. But also, I want you to understand that he was the trigger, he was the tool, he was the instrument that made all forgiveness possible by God. He had to die on that cross. He was the one and only instrument that allows you to be forgiven. God could not say you are forgiven if the cross had never happened. He is just and he is holy, and unless someone took the payment, he could not forgive us. It had to happen. Jesus has the, is the instrument of our forgiveness. He's also the authority of our forgiveness. Jesus wasn't a helpless victim in dying for mankind. He was totally in control. We see that in several phrases. John 10, 17 says he laid down his life and he'll take it up again. He declared the, the, the debt paid in full when he cried out, It is finished! He dismissed his spirit of himself. He resurrected, the Bible says, by his own power from the dead. He is the Savior and God you must come to if you would be free from your life's sin. Only Jesus has the power to save you. He alone purged your sin. Believe on Him and run to Him today to be saved. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, that is speaking of Jesus, shall be saved. You must believe it with your heart, confess it openly and not be ashamed and believe on Jesus Christ, realizing your sin and turning away. It's all not all about you. Listen, we have some older folks in this church, and we have some younger folks, and we have all in between. The younger folks think that they're invincible. The older folks worry about making it till tomorrow. All in between, we are hesitant, or we are tempted to think that everything's about us. Your life is not all about you. We have some new graduates here. They think they got the whole world in front of them, got the world by the tail. It's not about you. Be wise and give up your life now. It's not about you. You have so many plans and great things. It's not about you. The, the end of the phrase there, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. We'll see later in the chap chapter that this was God's goal all along. For Jesus to return from his earthly mission to sit down in the place of authority beside his Father. Now, he is different than before. At the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, nothing else, no matter, nothing, just him. And now all the universe creator, God returns, Jesus returns to the Godhead being changed. He is the God-man. He's experienced what it is like to be a created being. And he brings the empathy of a free will into heaven as he sits on the right hand of the Father. 
Philippians 2 says he thinks it not robbery to be equal with God. Equality with God is what he set aside when he came to Bethlehem. And equality with God is what he picked back up when he sat down on that throne again. He waits on that throne for God the Father to do exactly what his plan was when God was so low. And that plan, the whole plan, all the things that has gone on, the rebellion of man and the, the, the redemption of Jesus Christ, the shed blood, the torture, the, tor the, the return, the ascension, the sitting down, the interceder, the propitiation, he's a mediator, all of that, the wrap up in Armageddon, all that wrapping up for one thing, that God Almighty, God the Father may be able to grab all of it and hand it to Jesus and say, you are everything. And Jesus Christ will be all in all and every knee will bow and every tongue will exalt. All the universe was a stage for God the Father who wanted to exalt His Son. The only thing that is not, that Jesus Christ is not exalted over is the Father Himself. Everything else was a stage to glorify and to put spotlights on Jesus. Folks, this is the big picture. He is our loving and gracious Savior who alone wants to free us from the bondage of our sin, but don't miss the big picture of what our salvation is. It's part of exalting Jesus Christ. Maybe you can understand it like this. In the salvation, in, in the salvation wedding, it is not the bride who gets the attention. It's the groom. The groom is what is glorious. I leave you with some simple so what's this morning. This is a different kind of message, but there are some so what's. There are some application, and here it is. If you're living a sinful life against God, all right? I know I shut my Bible, but you better open your heart at this point, because this is it. If you're living a sinful life against God Almighty, you've never been saved. You've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, realizing your wickedness and your deserving and your guarantee of hell. You need to believe and submit to Jesus this morning. Turn from your sin and believe Him. He is the only hope for you. He was the substitution for you. He died on the cross to bring a rebellious you back to fellowship with God. You can't do it by any goodness of your own. Run to him this morning. In 1980, I ran to him, and my life has been all different because of it. And I plead with you that you would come. Don't hope. I met, I knocked on scores of doors, me and Mr. Green yesterday, of people who were trusting in their own goodness. They were adding Jesus plus. Jesus plus anything is damnation. Jesus alone is salvation. You must believe in him alone. So what number two, if you are already, if you already have come to Jesus for salvation, is everything in your life submitted to him? I mean, an awful lot of Christians who just live a carnal life day after day. They live, they know that they're saved and they're born again. But there's so many things in their life, if I, if I were to walk up and ask them, is, is that part of your life in conformity to, to what Jesus commands? They'd have to say, no, it's, it's really not. I'm working on this. How many, weird, how many years are you going to work on something you just need to submit? Can I ask you that? Are you getting up each morning wishing that that thing would go away? Or are you, you proactively taking it and making it a footstool to Jesus Christ? Submitting it to Jesus Christ. What known things in your life, Christian, are you allowing? Come on. It's not about you and your pleasure. Come on. It's about Jesus. Make it a footstool to Jesus today. Are you grasping with your fat fist control of something in your life that you need to open your hand today and say, that's it, Jesus. I don't care how much pleasure it brings me. It's yours. It's yours. Maybe that's a direction of your life, teens. Maybe there's some teens over here that God wants you to be in full-time Christian service, and you know it, but you really just want to be a lawyer, or you just want to make a lot of money, or you really want to live the American dream, and you want that hope of driving the fast car and to be looked at with respect. Can I ask you that you open your fat fist, you say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And that goes clear across the board. You know, many missionaries are called in their 30s and 40s and 50s. You can open your hand. You can trust the Lord. The third foot, so what, is this, Christian. Have you made Jesus big in your life? I mean, in worship. You know him as your Savior, but is that about it? You need to look at Jesus in the New Testament. You need to worship. You need to be able to sing the songs about Jesus with your heart swelling of how great He is, what great Savior, with the idea that, you're gonna, that everything is getting handed to Him. 
and it's the Father's will. And that when he is glorified, then his Father is glorified because it was his plan when, every, when they were just so low. Are you making him big in worship? Would you bow your heads, please?